Welcome to Candlelight Christian Fellowship. We are so glad you are here with us today. Join us now as we study the Word of God. Good morning, everyone. Would you stand with us as we worship the Lord? Worship the God who was. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy. You sing with us, I will not be anxious because Jesus, you are near. I will not be anxious, Jesus, you are near. And the peace of God, the peace 
of God surrounding me and casting out all fear. The hand that holds the heavens is the mighty hand that saves. And it's his voice. Voice that calms the stormy seas. He's calling me by name, and I'm singing in the victory, the victory of the cross. And I'm resting in the shadow of your redeeming love. And I'm standing on the promise, the promise of new life. I am yours forever And Jesus, you are mine And Jesus, you are mine And when I have forgotten fullness of your grace I'll remember Amen Yes I'll remember Calvary And when you took my place And I'm singing in the victory The victory of the cross I'm resting in the shadow
promise of new life Cause I am yours forever Jesus, you are mine Jesus, you are mine this moment if you just want to take take some time and say pray to the Lord tell him how much you love him praise him for all the goodness that he's given to you and if there's hurt going on and you think man I don't know if there's much goodness right now then praise God for the blood of Jesus amen but you just take a moment just you and the Lord you, Lord. I love you, Lord.
voices. Let's sing this one more time. I love you, Lord. Please be seated. Good morning, Candlelight. Welcome to our, uh, I want to say 7.30. Yeah, 7.30 a.m. service. Um, If you are new with us this morning, we want to give you a special welcome, and I invite you to go out to our information desk, and we have a little welcome packet for you, which has a little more information on Candlelight, and there's a little card you can find in there if you fill it out give that back to us. That lets us get to know you a little better and we can reach out, say hi, maybe get you connected somewhere if uh, you find something you like. Um, Also, if you're new with us, we have a newcomers class and so that allows you to come get some other newer people, uh, some of the pastors here and just a lot of the ministries we do and the history of Candlelight and all that. And We'd love to have you be a part of that. And we also have a membership class and uh, we ask that you would just prayerfully consider uh, what membership would look like and, and go visit the class and see what it is and consider if that's a step you want to take. Uh, Right now, we're going to go ahead and pray for our three ministries of the week, so let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us, Lord, that you have allowed us to wake up and to be here and to worship you today. We thank you so much for that incredible blessing. I thank you for those who are here today volunteering, uh, those up on the platform, those in the booth, those upstairs, those behind the scenes, Lord, that we're not seeing. Just bless them in that ministry today. Lord, we pray for Pastor Mark at the Coeur d'Alene Church of the Nazarene, that you would bless him, bless his congregation today, Lord, as he teaches. Lord, make your word such an important part of that ministry. Use him in such profound ways. Let him be a man who, when he speaks, people know that it is coming from you, that there's something special there and that they can see you in it and glorify you in that, Lord. And we pray for Alan Noggle with Gideon's International today. Lord, I pray that you would bless him, that you would continue to use him as we know you have, Lord, that you would continue to bless that ministry. And Lord, we also pray for Terry today, our our CPA. Lord, that you would bless her in her work, and we know how important she is here. Lord, I know that she doesn't get to come up on the platform, but Lord, as she is handling all of the finances of the church, making sure things are run smoothly, doing all of the complicated tax stuff, Lord, we pray that you would bless her and that you'd have your hand upon her. In Jesus' name, amen. No children, just fellowship. Just stand up and fellowship with each other. Thanks for listening to Candlelight Christian Fellowship's live broadcast. While our church family takes a break to greet each other, we would like to tell you a bit about ourselves. Candlelight Senior Pastor Paul Van Oy desires for all to grow in God's grace through the knowledge of the Lord. Pastor Paul and our pastoral staff are led to speak the truth in love as they teach about life challenges in today's world. 
The ministry goal is to teach God's word verse by verse and apply scripture in a way that's easy to understand. Candlelight is located in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho on the corner of Highway 95 and Dalton Avenue. We would love to meet you here in person, but realize that may not be possible. If you are unable to attend church at the Candlelight campus, please continue to listen or watch online and spread the word about Candlelight's ministry. If you have a request, we would love to pray for you. Email us at hope at candlelight.org or call us at 208-772-7755. Thanks again for listening. I always say, excuse me for a second. Thank you. I've got to go back to the gallon jug. But uh, welcome to all of those courageous few here, we band of true Christians who make it to the 730. So, <laughs> well, your faith costs you something, right? <laughs> so speaking of faith uh, costing something, this is the time of the month when we take a look at persecution here on Palm Sunday, as a matter of fact. Um, and a lot to cover, a lot's been going on worldwide. Uh, let's take a look at Nigeria because we've had another really rough couple of weeks in Nigeria. Muslim terrorists killed two Christians and kidnapped hundreds of others in an attack on the outskirts of Kaduna in northern Nigeria. They abducted dozens of people just days after more than 250 pupils from a school in the same state had been kidnapped. It's been 10 years, believe it or not, since the Boko Haram uh, kidnappings that generated a lot of international outrage when uh, another 250 girls were kidnapping and or kidnapped. And, and the reason I mention this, this is a point of particular argor of mine, uh, and that is when the media talk about this, I was reading the stories on this uh, from like the BBC and go to CNN and the other uh, what we call legacy media out there, and they never mention who the kidnappers were and who the kidnappees were. And in these incidents in Nigeria, the kidnappers are Muslims, and they're attacking the people who are Christians. And so at worst, they actually, or at best, they refer to it as ethnic conflict. It's not ethnic conflict. Uh, it's virtually a genocidal issue. Uh, and you have to keep that in mind. Why this is important is I've been looking at a lot of the Islamic press in the Middle East to see what they're saying about the situation in Gaza, and then listening to the Israeli point of view, and then comparing the Western point of view, notably our president's administration, and it's like night and day, okay? And what's happening is the media are seeing everything through what I call their wokus pocus filters, which have no connection with reality, you know? Uh, even as we try to get another two-state solution going in Gaza, nobody wants it. The Palestinians don't want it. The Israelis don't want it. You know, and it's very important to understand that's how much global media slant this. But here you've had an ongoing genocide in Nigeria. Somewhere between 20 and 30,000 Christians have been killed in the last 10 years. And it was 4,000 were killed in one year. That was a record between 2022 and 2023. Uh, right on that point. So it's really important to, so that you understand that. Um, Pakistan is an economic crisis, and we're directly keyed into Pakistan here at the church. They're in, they've been in talks with the IMF, uh, which is going to give them some rescue money right now, but that's only a bailout. And they, I don't know where this is going to end up. It's taken them two years uh, after elections to form a new government, and they're just barely holding that together. And the, one of the previous prime ministers has been put in jail. So it gives you an idea of what's there. Why is that important to us? The reason is, as political and economic tensions rise in that country, the key group that everybody likes to take it out on are Christians. 
and that's why it's important to talk about this. Uh, recently, an 18-year-old by the name of Ashbil Gauri was charged with blasphemy. He's been released on bail. He was arrested March 6th after a former Muslim classmate accused him of blaspheming Islam in a WhatsApp discussion. And he said he had no idea that defending his Christian faith against constant intimidation by classmates to convert to Islam would be used to persecute him. Uh, he stated that he did not say anything derogatory about Islam, but uh, he did ask questions which apparently antagonized the Muslim participants. If you really want to tick somebody off, use the Aristotelian method. That's just simply when they go blah, 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 then you say, oh, really? Uh, okay, well, do you mean this? Do you mean that? Do you mean this? And if there, uh, there was a, somebody had a car parked out here earlier in the week that said, um, stop the genocide, free Palestine. And so I thought, well, now this is an interesting one to unpack because you're telling me that we should free Palestine by starting genocide and that would stop another genocide. I mean, this is, blah, 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 you know, if I only had a brain. Uh, but this is what we're dealing with. And so if you really want to take somebody off about their faith, just start, you know, asking them questions. Don't bother defending yours. Ask them, you ask them questions. So, um, and I'll come back to Pakistan in just a second. Uganda, this is an ongoing situation. Islamic extremists in Uganda on March 8th killed 45-year-old Kaisa Masolo for leading Muslims to faith in Christ. He'd been preaching on the streets of local towns. Uh, three men uh, came into his house and uh, took him away. Three men remained, I'm sorry, six men broke in and uh, three men remained and told his mother that Allah was very displeased with her and they were going to punish him. After four hours of searching, they found his body. Uh, and so the idea of many Christians being attacked in Uganda, it's happening in other churches in Africa. Now, last thing here today, I mentioned, I asked you to pray for Myanmar uh, and Christian institutes in Myanmar, like orphanages. I couldn't say any more because there was a critical crisis in, ongoing with a particular orphanage there, and I was pretty much pledged to silence about it. Uh, what had happened is, is they've got a civil war going on there. The rebels are sympathetic towards the Christians, but the military had been running around, and the situation for this orphanage finally became intolerable. There were bombs going off outside the orphanage, and people were being shot in the streets. So they decided to make a run for it. And they set out at 4 a.m. Uh, in two vans, and they had a grand total. Let me see how many people were there. It was about, I think, five staff members and something like 20 kids, something along that. So they made a break for it. They had guides to take them through military territory. There were bridges that were destroyed by the military. They had to cross through water, and they were forced to drive through rivers in very difficult terrain. It was hazardous but they finally made it into Northeast India where they're safe. So that's a thank God for that. And for those of you people who prayed, thank you very much. I mean, we were, everybody was holding their breath and, and praying for this. The reason I mention this is this is important. A lot of times what happens through the Asia missions when you give to that, uh, I can't talk about it here. There's a lot that just goes on behind the backgrounds, bailing people out of jails and, and doing other things. So when you contribute to that fund, that's what's going on. You know, we're very active. We're going to do some feeding during on uh, Resurrection Sunday. We'll, we'll uh, feed a whole bunch of people that come to the church, etc. And we're talking about a property swap now. We had property donated for building a new church in, uh, in Lahore, but it's in a Muslim neighborhood. It would take a huge amount of money to destroy the building that's there. It's, it goes all the way back to colonial times and rebuild it. And we're talking about a property swap now in a Christian neighborhood uh, with a slight add-on, and Candlelight's very much involved in that. But that's what your contributions to the fund do for us, so I appreciate it. And I tell you as much as I can, you know, <laughs> that doesn't violate security. Lord God, please remember those suffering for their faith, especially those who are most critical right now. And uh, Christians who were caught up in the middle of war, there are uh, evangelical churches that are being persecuted in Russian-controlled parts of Ukraine where they're shutting down uh, non-Orthodox churches, etc. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Good morning. My name is John Padula. I am uh, one of the assistant pastors over at the Altar Church, 
and uh, I'm excited to be here this morning. Uh, pastor Paul gave me three minutes, and he told me I have to be timely, and since I'm a pastor, I need to speak quick. So I'm going to share my testimony with you guys a little bit. Um, I was born and raised in North Idaho. Uh, I was born in a family who does not know Jesus. Uh, my parents divorced at the age of 12, and being a very rebellious young man, I turned to drugs and alcohol and uh, ended up bound by pornography for 21 years. Uh, I was completely lost and broken in my sin. I started using meth at the age of 13, and I used meth for about 17 years. And uh, my life was complete chaos. Fifteen years ago, through the Good Samaritan program, I heard the gospel for the very first time. At the age of 30 in North Idaho, I had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I had people tell me about church. I would had people tell me, oh, God loves you and just believe and all of this nonsense. But nobody in 30 years in North Idaho shared the gospel with me. And I just want to remind you, church, that the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's where the power to save is. It's not in anything else but Jesus. The very first time I heard the gospel, I was born again, redeemed of a life of sin, and completely set free. It wasn't a process. It wasn't uh, anything else. When I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior on December 5th of 2008, um, all of my iniquity was gone. And... Uh, Another miracle in that, uh, the doctors told me that I would never have children, that I had a zero count. I had went to the doctors in St. Alphonsus in 2002, and they said, by the way, I know you're having these other issues, but you'll never have children. I got married in 2000 and, oh, don't tell my wife, uh, 2011, and we had our first child within that first year, and now I have four beautiful children. So when God healed me spiritually, he also healed me physically and gave me new life. I was hired at the Altar Church in 2014. I've been the outreach pastor ever since, and my wife and I started a 501c3 called Set Apart Discipleship in 2013, uh, taking people who are struggling with addiction into our home. Uh, we've had 600, over 600 men live with us in the last 12 years of marriage, and all of them coming uh, out of a life of sin, whether it's drugs, alcohol, perversion, uh, whatever it is, uh, they were bound in their iniquity and they were looking for Christ. And the reason that I want to share all of this with you today is because I desperately need your prayer. Uh, I have decided because of God's prompting for the last year to run for Kootenai County Commissioner because what's happening in Kootenai County is very concerning. Uh, we have over and over and over tried to use carnal means to fight a spiritual war, and it's not working. And we need to wake up, and we need to start electing men and women of God to put in these positions, uh, not to be politicians, but to be public servants. And that's what's lacking in Kootenai County. So I'm not asking you to vote for me, but if you do vote and you want to vote for a servant, I promise you I will serve God, I will serve the people, uh, but I also ask everybody to do your due diligence and look at all of the candidates because we need to be informed voters, and uh, I think that's, that's about all I got. So God bless you guys, and thank you for the time today. So you guys know the drill around here. Um, Candlelight as an institution does not endorse candidates, but I do. And this guy has my endorsement for sure. I think it's troubling that there are many people in our community today that will not endorse Johnny because he had in his background what he shared with you today. Uh, he was a felon. I, I can't help but think about Paul the Apostle. Amen. You know, I mean, if we were really to think through the process, most people in our culture today would not endorse Paul the Apostle to serve in our community. That's right. And I think we need to think that through very, very clearly. And so uh, you have my endorsement, my friend. Thank you, sir. I love you, buddy. I love you, too. Amen. Thanks. Father, thank you for Johnny. Thank you for the work that you're doing through him, the work that you have been doing through him. Lord, I do pray that you would lead and guide him to serve exactly where you intend and Lord, as we also are here in this very moment, we pray for Pastor Tim and for his mom, both in the hospital today. 
And we ask for a continued healing and recovery for both of them, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Here, lose that for me. Thanks. Praise the Lord. So, um, Pastor Tim, if you are shocked by that prayer, uh, had a surgery on Friday early, early in the morning. I went in to see him in the hospital. Uh, he had some complications from scar tissue. He's doing very well. Uh, his mom was taken into the hospital today. They thought she might have had a heart attack, but she's doing okay. And so that was a stressful moment for her the last couple of days. When I went in to see Pastor Tim, she was sitting in the hallway trying to protect him from people like me uh, <laughs> getting into the room. But uh, you guys know I, I don't like rules. And so... <laughs> I, I told her I loved her, but I was going in. And so I went in right behind a nurse, and I heard her talking. So I thought, well, we're good to go. So I shook up Pastor Tim and looked his right in the face, and eye to eye prayed with him and told him that we all love him. We support him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for this time today, and thank you for the opportunity to share yet again another installment of our study through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Lord, I do pray that in brief today, as we cover a lot of ground, that we will have these observations to assist us in our defense of a pre-tribulation rapture, as we do focus on the fact that Paul has told us that this is a mystery. And so, Lord, help us to understand the things that you are now revealing that had been hidden in times past. We do thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul says, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. And I'll come back to that. I want to talk about the last trump. What does that mean, the last trumpet? The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and therefore comfort one another with these words. And so this is our 12th lesson in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And again, I'm using PowerPoint today. I won't continue to do this much longer, but I think it's helpful to you. I'm going to be moving very quickly today. A lot of these items I will just read. You can look at them later and think those th thoughts through. And so we have been dealing with dispensational theology and why it's important to biblical understanding. The church as distinct from Israel and the redeemed from other dispensations. And then the, the last week we talked about the purpose of the tribulation, the rapture, what is it? The purpose of the rapture and then the timing of the rapture. Now we're dealing with the second coming of Jesus as distinct from the rapture. This is very confusing to many people. You read passages of scripture that you think apply to the rapture. Uh, rapture, and yet you're reading second coming passages. And so I want to just give you a little briefing on this today. Uh, the millennial kingdom will be coming up. I'll be away in Israel for a couple of weeks, but uh, we'll have our wonderful services on the celebration of first fruits next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And then when I get back, the millennial kingdom and the whatever otherwise I want to share section. And so we'll keep on working our way through that. So the rapture of the church takes place at the end of the church age. You know this now. Here's a couple of verses that I wanted to highlight to your attention. This is a verse that relates to the rapture, not the second coming. Behold, I tell you a mystery. I just quoted this. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Likewise, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, this it relates to the rapture. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. 
and the dead in Christ will be raised. Arise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Harpazo, this is the word that is used that where we get the word rapture from the Latin. They will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And again, therefore, comfort one another with these words. And if there is a pre-tribulation rapture, then we will not be here, as we've discussed, during the tribulation, which is a dispensation of wrath. And therefore, we should be comforted knowing that God is not going to pour out his wrath upon us. He has done that in Christ. And the judgment of God that we deserve has been taken in Christ, upon Christ already. And therefore, we will not suffer the wrath of God. He has appointed us to escape the wrath to come. So here's some things about the rapture that you should know. At the rapture, Jesus comes for his bride, uh, the living and the dead in Christ. So we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. The them are those that have passed away, people from the church age. So he comes for his bride. Secondly, at the rapture, the translated saints go to heaven. That is to the father's house. We'll come back to that. Number three, the rapture is imminent, could occur at any moment and has no prerequisite signs. Uh, Not so with the second coming, as you'll see. Number four, at the rapture, evil is unleashed by the removal of the restrainer. Uh, Again, much Bible study in each one of these points. Number five, the rapture is a blessing for the believer. It is the blessed hope. We are told to look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're not commanded to look for the arrival of the Antichrist or even the signing of a peace treaty between Israel and the surrounding nations. Number six, the rapture is not directly stated in the Old Testament. This is why Paul calls it a mystery. It was concealed in the Old Testament, but now we have information in the New Testament that unveils, reveals those things that were once hidden. Number seven, the rapture occurs before the tribulation, which is Daniel's 70th week. You may remember that from last week. And number eight, at the rapture, we meet the Lord in the air. Number nine, at the rapture, only his own see him. Underscore that in your minds. Only his own see him. And number 10, finally, the tribulation begins with a seven-year peace treaty. So the second coming happens after the seven-year tribulation. Here's a couple of verses on the second coming. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Remember, we just looked at this, and only the raptured will see the Lord at the time of the rapture, no other eyes. But in this case, every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. Talking about the Jews, the Romans, everyone that will be awakened or aware of what is taking place at this time. The tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. The tribes in this case refer to the Jewish tribes. They will be resurrected. There is a judgment upon Israel during the seven-year tribulation. That is the purpose of the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation period, a dispensation of wrath. But in this case, they will mourn. And this we can find reference to in Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14. Then in Revelation chapter 19, now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. He who sat on Him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, in preparation now for the millennial kingdom. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe 
and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we're looking for the blessed hope when we escape the wrath to come. And when the Lord comes at the second coming, he comes to make war with the nations that have set themselves against Israel. He is coming to rescue Israel. There's a big leap to get from the rapture to the second coming in this case, but many people just read all of these passages as one and the same. So here's some observations. Number one, at the second coming, Jesus returns with his bride. When the rapture occurs, he comes for his bride. Number two, at the second coming, no one is translated to heaven. The resurrected are on the earth and there's the judgment of the nations and then the beginning of the millennial kingdom where there will indeed be the marriage supper of the lamb. Thirdly, the second coming follows predictive signs, including the tribulation. I mentioned already point three under the rapture. There are no predictive signs. We are to expect the Lord at any time. But the second coming has predictive signs. There are many things that must occur before the second coming of Christ takes place. Number four, just after the second coming, Satan is bound for 1,000 years and evil is restrained. Remember, at the rapture, the restrainer is removed. But at the second coming, evil is restrained. Number five, the second coming is blessing for the nation and remnant of of Israel. Jesus is referred to in the Old Testament as the hope of Israel. Not by name, but Jesus is indeed the hope of Israel. And now we know his name, Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel. Number six, the second coming is specifically predicted in the Old Testament, whereas I mentioned the rapture is not, but the second coming is. Number seven, the second coming concludes the tribulation, whereas the rapture begins uh, after, or the tribulation begins after the rapture. Number eight, at the second coming, Jesus returns to the earth. And as mentioned, we are removed from the earth and we meet the Lord in the air. Number nine, at the second coming, every eye shall see him. And you'll remember that at the rapture, No one sees him, but we do. Uh, And the rest of the world does not see him. We um, immediately, in a twinkling of an eye, are translated from this planet, off the planet, invisibly. And yet when we return, every eye will see him, riding on a white horse and the armies in heaven coming with him. And finally, at the second coming, the battle of Armageddon will occur. This is Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, also Revelation 19. Some people placed the Ezekiel Gog Magog invasion before the tribulation. That is error. Uh, If you are careful in your Bible study, you will begin to realize immediately that the Ezekiel 38-39 invasion concludes the tribulation period. And we know this because from that day forward, the Lord will make himself known to Israel and he will no longer hide his face from them anymore, end quote. And so... He is hidden from them during the tribulation, but he is revealed to them at the second coming when every eye shall see him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Why? Because they recognize what they've done with their Messiah. So the millennium will follow. This is a literal 1,000 year period of time. When Jesus will reign on the earth, we will reign with him. The resurrected saints from Old Testament, uh, Old Testament dispensations and the tribulation will be raised up at that time, likewise, to serve the Lord and to reign with him. And the mortals that pass through his judgment, the sheep and goat judgment, after the tribulation will go into the millennial kingdom. It is there in the millennial kingdom that we will enjoy the wedding feast, which many people believe will take place in heaven. It will not. The wedding takes place in heaven. The wedding feast takes place on the earth during the millennial kingdom. And it is described in great detail in the Old Testament. And so here's a couple of passages for your perusal and based on what we've already considered related to saints saints and saints. If you were here, you know what I'm talking about. 
At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, that is Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble. This is the tribulation period, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. You'll remember last week and the week before, we talked about the fact that Jeremiah, Daniel, and Jesus all identified the tribulation as a separate and distinct period of time, not to be confused with any other. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. It is a time that such as never was, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life. Some from the old covenant dispensation. And in this case specific to Israel. Will be raised. And so there will be a resurrection of the old covenant persons that were in faith. Who have died in the Lord before the church age. The church age believers will be raised up at the rapture, but the old covenant saints will be raised up at the time of the second coming. And if we don't make that distinction, obviously it gets very blurry. People read this and go, well, look, here it is. You can't avoid it. It's obvious that this is the time of the rapture, but it is not. It is the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. And then when you see, and some to everlasting contempt, you might put a bracket there because it would actually read in the eschaton this way, some to everlasting life at the time of the second coming, and then after the thousand years, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So we know that there is a resurrection of the unrighteous. They are raised up to suffer the judgment of God at the great white throne judgment. And remember, believers, there is no future condemnatory judgment for the believer. If you are in Christ Jesus, he has paid it all. All to him you owe. You have nothing to fear. You're not looking ahead at a judgment where God is going to condemn you. And that will include the tribulation period. It includes the time of the second coming when he comes to judge the nations. And it will not involve the great white throne judgment. We're going to be with the Lord, reigning with the Lord. And forever we will be comforted by the truth of scripture. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Revelation chapter 20, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image. These are individuals that were killed during the tribulation period. And had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So you have the Old Testament saints raised up at the second coming. And the tribulation saints raised up at the second coming. Make the distinction, this is not the rapture of the church. This is the resurrection of the Old Covenant saints and the tribulation saints. And so here's a few things we should observe, just a couple things here. At the second coming, the Old Testament and tribulation saints are resurrected. These are the friends and guests at the wedding. Now, if you're reading Matthew and you look at the kingdom parables and you read about the the wedding that is being planned by a father for his son, you recognize right away that there are friends that are invited to the wedding. There are guests that are invited to the wedding. These are the individuals that will be saved out of the tribulation or out of the old covenant dispensation, not the church, but out of the old covenant dispensation and tribulation that will be invited to the wedding feast that will take place on the earth. This is where John the Baptist dialed this in for us when he says very specifically, he was a friend of the bridegroom, but you are the bride of Christ. You're not invited to the wedding. The, the wedding is for you. And so you and your husband, our Lord and Savior, will return from the Father's house and there on the earth will have the wedding feast and there will be friends and guests that will be present. And these are the resurrected saints and these are likewise those that transmit through 
the entirety of the tribulation period and then are passing under the rod of the shepherd when he does the sheep and goat judgment. Secondly, after the second uh, coming, the sheep and goat judgment occurs. And I want to point this out because many people don't place that in the right timeline on their eschaton. So in this case, the rapture takes place, then the signing of the peace treaty, then the wrath of God is poured out on the entire earth because of the rebellion and idolatry and a lack of repentance that men have demonstrated in all of the old covenant dispensations and likewise the church age. So the Jew and Gentile alike are offered the gospel today and the Jew and Gentile who have rejected the gospel today are going to suffer the wrath of God during the tribulation period. Israel will be threatened. The Lord is going to see to it that Israel is never wiped off the planet again. He will come at the second coming to make war against those that are making war against Israel to rescue Israel that is when every eye will see him they will look upon the one whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and then the sheep and goat judgment will occur where the nations are judged based on the way they treated Israel remember what you did and did not do relates to the least of these my brethren Not to just the doing of things in the church age. It doesn't apply to you. It applies to those during the tribulation that handled Israel properly. Now, of course, we believe in handling Israel properly today for a number of reasons. But this sheep and goat judgment will be for the nations and the way they handled Israel. The nations will be judged. Some of them will suffer greatly. One in particular, Egypt. Egypt is going to have a 40-year suffering at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, and then they will be restored later on in the millennium. And so we know where the sheep and goat judgment occurs. And then at this, after the second coming, the millennial reign begins, just so that you're keeping your timeline intact. So here's some observations. Again, I know I'm going quickly today, and I've got a hundred more slides, and so we'll see how we can do, how well we do. Number one, these are observations. The tribulation relates to Israel and unbelieving Gentiles, not the church. Number two, no Old Testament passage related to the tribulation mentions the church. Number three, no New Testament passage pictures the church on earth during the tribulation. In fact, the church age is pictured in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And after these things in chapter 4, he shows you, the Lord shows John the things that will take place after this. And so after what? After the church age. Number four, the church is not appointed to wrath. We are promised salvation from the wrath to come. Number five, if the church suffers the wrath of God, the completed work of Christ was and is insufficient this i want you to understand if you have to suffer for your sins anytime in the future that means jesus did not pay at all he did not die for your sins in its entire in their entirety and he has remembered your sins and lawless deeds but the bible tells us very clearly that your sins and lawless deeds he will remember no more Now, if he says, I will remember your sins and lawless deeds no more, then I'm going to take his word for it. That means he will remember our sins and lawless deeds no more. That means you, Johnny. That means Jesus will never hold your past against you, and neither should we. People today need to know that they they have been made the righteousness of God in him, in Jesus. Number six, it is characteristic of God to deliver believers before divine wrath and judgment. I want you to think about Enoch. I want you to think about Noah. I want you to think about Lot. Even taking Lot, that righteous man who we would have thought of as unrighteous, but he was called righteous by faith alone in the Lord. And he was taken out of Sodom before judgment. Enoch was taken out before the flood. Noah was protected before the flood in the ark. God does not pour out his wrath on his own. Keep that in mind. Number seven, the rapture of the church is not the focus of the passages dealing with the second coming. 
These distinctions have to be made. Number eight, a consistent hermeneutic demands a distinction between saints, church, and saints based on dispensation and context. And the reason I bring it up this way is because there are saints in the Old Testament. Daniel 12 references saints that will be trodden under the foot of the Antichrist. Those are Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints. Now, in this context, then you have after the uh, end of the old covenant dispensation, the cross of Christ, the redeemed and the day of Pentecost, the birthday of the church, you have the church who are also referred to as saints. Paul tells the Romans, you are called saints. And then you have the tribulation saints. These are three distinct groups of people and we need to keep that intact as we study our uh, dispensational model, as you study the scriptures in order to have a sound hermeneutic. Number nine, all Old Testament passages addressing the time of Jacob's trouble identify the godly remnant as saints, not the church. So there is no mention of the church age saints in the Old Testament per se. There is a passage or two that refers to the Gentile nations being blessed because of what God is doing with Israel. And in you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, he says to Abraham. But as far as the church itself is concerned, references to saints is to the Old Testament saints, not to the church. Number 10, the consistent hermeneutic demands a distinction between tribulation and the great tribulation. The many who are arguing against pre-trib are going to say, look, you just want to escape the problems of this world. No. Jesus said, in this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So you're going to go through trouble. Look at the persecuted church all around the world. Think about what's going on in Pakistan today. Think about all the people that are suffering even here in our own neighborhood today. They're going through tribulation, but tribulation and the great tribulation are not to be confused. The great tribulation is a seven year period of God's divine wrath poured out upon the disobedient, both Jew and Jew and Gentile. So I think I'm going to need to probably abbreviate here. I'm going to finish this section and then we'll pick up uh, the next little, I'll tease you with it in a minute. But um, scripture is to be understood using a literal interpretation method and less identifiably typological and allegorical. I should just slow down and I won't speech all over myself. Scripture is to be understood using a literal interpretation method and less identifiably typological or allegorical. He will hide you under the shadow of his wings. Okay, are we going to say that God has wings or, you know, as a, a, a hen wants to gather her chicks? Uh, okay, this is literally allegory. But in the case of Scripture, if the plain sense makes the most sense, All right, you guys are paying attention. Seek no other sense. This is true of both the Old Testament and New uh, New Testament and Old Testament passages dealing with the tribulation. And so a literal outpouring of God's wrath. Number 12, since the first 69 weeks of Daniel were literally fulfilled, and we know them by calculation, even to this day, we're celebrating today Palm Sunday. And it was exactly 483 years to the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as per the scriptures as described for us in the book of Nehemiah and the command to go back and rebuild the city and its walls. And so they went back on that day, beginning that journey and calculated by Daniel chapter 9, 483 years later, the Lord rode into Jerusalem to be observed for four days and then to be crucified on Passover, Nisan 14 of that year. Number 13, all 70 weeks of Daniel are in reference to Israel, her relationship to God, her rebellious acts of disobedience, uh, her engagement with Gentile powers and her rejection of Jesus as Messiah. And then finally, number 14, believers in the church age are told to look for the Lord, not the arrival of the Antichrist, which I mentioned already. 
And so we're looking for the blessed hope. This is a mystery but that he talks about. Uh, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Amen? Let's stand together. I did have a few more slides. I'll bump those over to next Sunday or the f- following. So, uh, Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the blessing and privilege you have given to us to be here today to study scripture together. Use us for your glory. Allow us to be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks of us for the hope that lies within us with meekness and godly fear. Send us forth into our mission field today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.
Welcome to Candlelight Christian Fellowship. We are so glad you are here with us today. Join us now as we study the Word of God. Good morning, everyone. Would you stand and worship the Lord with us? We worship the God who was. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory.
peace of God surrounding me and casting out all fear. The hand that holds the heavens is the mighty hand that saves. Voice that calms the stormy sea. It's calling me by name. And I'm singing in the victory, the victory of the cross. And I'm resting in the shadow of your redeeming love. And I'm standing on the promise, the promise of new life. I am yours forever And Jesus, you are mine And Jesus, you are mine When I have forgotten fullness of your grace I'll remember, amen Oh yes, I'll remember Calvary Oh, when you took my place And I'm singing in the victory The victory of the cross And I'm resting in the shadow
of new life Cause I am yours forever and Jesus, you are mine Yes, Jesus, you are mine this time, I just want to invite you to talk to God. We're going to play some music for a moment, and then we'll sing one last song together, but I, respond to him. Pray, give him thanks. Sing him a song, hum him a melody. But just take this, mind, this moment to speak to the Lord, just to, to give your praise to him on your own.
Father, we do, we love you. That is why we are here. That is why we come week in and week out. That is why we fellowship with believers, why we have friends who are believers, Lord God, why we share the gospel with those who don't know you, Father, because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us, Lord God, shedding his blood to wash clean sinners like us, Lord. Lord, we love you so much. And it is a pleasure to lift our voices to worship you. Father, as we continue to worship through prayer and through opening the word and hearing a message from you, Father, I ask that our hearts would continue to be sincere, poured out for you, because Lord, we love you. We thank you and we praise you and we give you all the honor and all the glory forever and ever in Jesus' name, amen. Would you please be seated? Have we worshiped the Lord this morning already? Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand again in praise and thanks for this worship team that's served us and served the Lord this morning. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you here, especially if you're visiting with us. It's so good to have you here at Candlelight, where Candlelight meets. Candlelight isn't the place. It is us, and we welcome you. We're glad you're here. If you are a visitor, will you stop by the welcome counter before you go this morning and grab a welcome packet? And as you sort of flip through there, get the card out of there, fill it out, turn it back in to the welcome desk at some point and let us reach out to you. We hope to help you get plugged in and kind of oriented here. And as part of that, we offer regularly, generally quarterly, we offer newcomers classes. And so the information about that is online. You can pick a time and a a day, and actually we pick the time and day, but try to give you notice ahead of time. We offer you the the opportunity to join in, and I hope that you will by signing up online, and that will let you know kind of the basics. And then as the Lord leads you, should you decide to become a member of Candlelight, and this is something that we do practically for accountability reasons, we've kind of organized and orchestrated what membership means at Candlelight. It's voluntary, but we try to let you know kind of how that is all set up and what the benefits are. And so then you'll have the opportunity for that as well in our membership classes. So take note of those, take advantage of those opportunities as the Lord leads. Well, just now let's bow our hearts as we do at Candlelight every uh, twice a week, Sundays and Wednesdays. And let's bow our hearts and pray for our three ministries of the week. Father, we thank you this morning for Coeur d'Alene Church of the Nazarene, and we pray for Pastor Mark. We pray that he would be blessed, that as he is pastoring and ministering and equipping the saints in his orbit, that he will be blessed, that his words will be your word as he opens your word. I pray, Lord, that it will be clear and that your compassion and your conviction will come through in precise measure and that their congregation will be a blessing to our community in that way. Lord, we are thankful for the ministry of Gideon's International, in particular, Alan. We thank you for Alan's ministry among us, in particular his focus on evangelism and keeping us clear and uh, on the edge of our seats and ready and poised to be witnesses to your gospel. And Gideon's, Lord, we pray that you would bless Gideon's International and continue to hold the line and even advance the line on making New Testaments and Psalms available to schools, to hospitals, to hotels. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless Gideon's and bless Alan. And then, Lord, in our own house, we're grateful for Terry. We pray that you would bless her and the accountants and the work that they do to keep us financially squared away and aligned and accountable. And we particularly pray for Terry's health and her protection and blessings as she comes and goes and serves us in accounting. Lord, just now we thank you again that we have been able to worship and we do this by your grace. And now we ask as we receive notice of the persecuted church and as we hear testimony and then we hear from your word, I pray that our hearts would be open. And we pray and believe in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, our children can be dismissed this way, our youth out to the lobby and over to Skate Plaza, and the rest of us. Let's stand up, greet one another in Jesus' name this morning.
Thanks for listening to Candlelight Christian Fellowship's live broadcast. While our church family takes a break to greet each other, we would like to tell you a bit about ourselves. Candlelight Senior Pastor Paul Van Oy desires for all to grow in God's grace through the knowledge of the Lord. Pastor Paul and our pastoral staff are led to speak the truth in love as they teach about life challenges in today's world. The ministry goal is to teach God's word verse by verse and apply scripture in a way that's easy to understand. Candlelight is located in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho on the corner of Highway 95 and Dalton Avenue. We would love to meet you here in person, but realize that may not be possible. If you are unable to attend church at the Candlelight campus, please continue to listen or watch online and spread the word about Candlelight's ministry. If you have a request, we would love to pray for you. Email us at hope at candlelight.org or call us at 208-772-7755. Thanks again for listening. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I would love to spend a lot of time fellowshipping, but we're on the radio, so we have to match time. So <laughs> God bless you all. We have a lot to cover this morning. This is the time of the month, Palm Sunday, by the way, in which we cover the uh, persecuted church. And I'm going to jump right into it. Muslim terrorists killed two Christians and kidnapped hundreds of others in an attack on the outskirts of the city of Kaduna in northern Nigeria. The gunman abducted dozens of people just days after more than 250 students were abducted from a school in the state there. This is about 10 years since Boko Haram kidnapped about 230 uh, Christian girls, if you remember. What is always interesting is that when you're looking at the coverage of the war in Gaza or this issue in Nigeria, is how the Western filters color everything that they see and in many cases are not connected to reality. I was reading through the BBC report on this, not a single mention of who the kidnappers were uh, and who the kidnappees were. Well, the kidnappers were Muslims and the kidnappees were Christians. And that was the same thing as in times past. Um, and this is important because if you look at what's going on in the Middle East, the, I've been starting to spend more time listening to the Islamic press in various countries and some of the media there to hear what they're saying than listening to what's going on in Israel. And then you look at the narrative we're having coming out of our media and the people in the streets, and it's like there's this world of difference between the two. Okay, and that's important to understand that everything is being seen through the wokus pocus filters of, uh, of the Western media. Okay, and it really, it's creating problems. Uh, by the way, uh, we are doing a series, uh, it's sort of the best kept secret at Candlelight right now, called Stone of Stumbling. It's on Rumble. Pastor Jason and I are doing it. We go into the history of the current conflict and other backgrounders, and we're just about to do one since, uh, since Paul is talking about eschatology right now in the rapture. You may or may not know it, but Islam has its own end times eschatology and is playing very much into what's going on in the Middle East and the fight is always over Jerusalem because the Shiites expect that the Imam Ma'adi, the 12th Imam, will set up his caliphate in Jerusalem and proceed to kill all the Jews and get rid of the Israelis. Uh, there are some novels that are circulating in the Middle East right now uh, that are very popular in Arabic, which uh, my best description is Tom Clancy meets Tim LaHaye meets Mohammed. You know, that's the, the best thing. They're incredibly popular, and they're influencing even the way terrorists think. So we're going to talk about that. I think next week we'll have it up on the, on the series, but you can find it on our website as well. Pakistan is in economic crisis right now, and we'll talk about why that's uh, pertinent to persecution. Pakistan is an economic crisis. The IMF was there last week and they were having talks. They're going to give them a little bailout money. This is just a band-aid. It's not going to stop the ongoing uh, monetary crisis they had. It's been two years that they've been trying to form a government since the last elections and one of their prime ministers, recent prime ministers, has been thrown in jail. 
uh, they have the same problem with weaponized uh, warfare too over there, lawfare going on. Now, why is this pertinent to uh, persecution? It's pertinent because as the tensions rise in the country, as the Pakistani, um, I forgot it was, ruble, no, not ruble, I just had a brain, brain freeze. Uh, the Pakistani currency uh, devalues against the dollar. Living becomes harder and harder for the people who are there. And as tensions rise, they pick on the Christians. That's why. You know, and so this is ongoing. Remember, just last August, it was that we had Muslim mobs attacking churches and homes and everything else on just the allegation that uh, somebody had committed blasphemy. And so why this is important uh, for the people there. This week, uh, an 18-year-old by the name of Ashbi Ulgari has been released on bail after he's been accused of blasphemy. He had had a conversation with a former Muslim classmate on WhatsApp. In January, he was accused of blasphemy. He said he had no idea that defending his Christian faith against constant intimidation by his classmates to convert to Islam would be used to persecute him. Uh, he said he didn't say anything bad about Islam, just asked questions which apparently antagonized his uh, Muslim opponents on WhatsApp. And by the way, whenever you get into a conversation with people, if you really want to tick them off, don't bother asking uh, you're telling what you believe about things, ask them why they believe what they believe and keep picking on it, you know. And if their platform is very shaky, you can take it apart in two minutes and then you usually get a very negative response. Uh, Uganda, Christian was slain for leading Muslims to faith in Christ. A young man, 45, well, not that young, 45-year-old, was uh, killed on March 8th in Uganda. He had come home after preaching on the streets of local towns. Uh, three, six men were there. Three of them remained behind after they abducted him and told him, his mother, that Allah was very unhappy with him and that he would be punished. Four, four hours later, they found his body. Now, last month, I asked if you would pray for Myanmar, and I couldn't say much more because there's a civil war going on there, and Christian institutions have been affected. I can tell you a little more this month. What happened was there's an orphanage there with probably about six staff members, 18 children, and the war had become absolutely intolerable for them. Bombs were going off outside the, outside the orphanage. People were being shot in the streets, etc. So they decided to make a run for it, to get out of there. And they left at 4 o'clock in the morning in two vans going through military-controlled ter uh, territory where a lot of the bridges had been destroyed, so they had to go through rivers and everything else. But they finally made it to safety in India. Uh, and everybody that was in on this, first of all, we were sort of pledged to silence. And second of all, uh, we were all praying that God would work supernatural things, that they would just be invisible to the military there, which is apparently what happened. This is a lot of times when we talk about our Asia missions here, where we've been bailing people out of jail, providing food for people, etc. This is where a lot of it goes to. We can't always talk about everything. So a lot of it's invisible uh, to candlelight members. But when you keep funds coming into Asia missions, that helps support this work. We're either feeding people, getting them out of jail. Uh, and as, as God provides these things, they just uh, go handle this situation, go deal with that. Providing a motorcycle for a pastor who's operating in Taliban territory. The U.S. dollar goes a long way in Pakistan. Um, so... I wanted to thank you for what you're doing. If you please help the contributions keep coming in, we appreciate that. Lord God, please remember those suffering for their faith, especially those who are least known but most need our prayer. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, sir. Well, good morning, church. My name is John Padula. I am the outreach pastor at the Altar Church in Coeur d'Alene. And uh, your pastor, Paul Vanoy, is a dear friend of mine. And he blessed me with the opportunity to speak to you for only three minutes this morning. And no more than three minutes. So uh, I was born and raised in North Idaho. Uh, at 30 years old, I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time. I was born again and my whole life changed. Before that, I was a drug addict. I was addicted to pornography. Uh, I had received two felonies, one in 1997 and one in 2002. Uh, the state of Idaho did pardon me in 2018, and in 2005, I was pardoned by the blood of Jesus. Uh, he completely redeemed me, changed my life. And uh, since then, um, 
my wife and I have had a ministry. I got married two years after I got saved. I have a beautiful wife named Amanda right there and four beautiful children. Uh, part of my testimony is I couldn't have kids before I got saved. And when I was born again, I got married and we found out we were pregnant. Of course, my first thought was, whose is it? <laughs> because it's not mine. I can't have kids. I didn't realize that when God saved me and redeemed me that he also healed me physically. So he has blessed me with four beautiful children. My wife and I started a ministry called Set Apart Discipleship in 2013, and we've had over 600 men live with us in the last 12 years of marriage. And uh, most of them come out of addiction. Some of them come out of alcoholism, uh, pornography, or just hopelessness. We've had people come in and live with us that just wanted to find Jesus, and they were at the end of their rope. So... Um, God has been extremely faithful in our lives, and recently I have decided because of, in my opinion, God has definitely led me in this direction. I'm running for Kootenai County Commissioner uh, for seat one. And I'm not asking for your vote, but what I am asking for is for you to do your research, be an informed voter, and make sure that you're, if you are a voter, that you vote because of who God is in your life, not because of politicians or educated men. Politicians and educated men have got us in the boat that we're in today, and we need men who are filled with the Holy Ghost to be in these positions, men who get their wisdom from God to be in these positions, and men and women who are humble enough to listen to the community and make decisions uh, based on what the community desires. Because government is here to serve the people and protect their rights. They're not here to serve their own interests. So. Uh, Vote for John Padula, County Commissioner. Can I say that? Yeah, you can say that for right. sure. Right. Lord, thank you for Johnny. I just am so proud of him, Lord. And we stand with him. And Lord, he has my endorsement. I know you know that. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Here. Thank you. Yeah. So Pastor Tim's in the hospital. And... Um, He's recovering. He's doing really well. Uh, he had a, a little uh, snafu with some of the injuries that he sustained earlier on with uh, the shooting. And uh, so they've made a couple of adjustments, and he's doing really well. His mom also, we thought she had a heart attack this morning. And so she's in the hospital now, but they've t done some tests, and she's doing okay. So we keep praying for them. Today we're going to continue our study and um, we are actually in the 12th lesson of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the fourth lesson in relationship to the PowerPoint that I am using to give you some real focus on the pre-tribulation rapture. And so we've been dealing with this for several weeks now, the first thing we talked about was dispensational theology and why it's important to biblical understanding. The second thing we looked at was the church as distinct from Israel and the redeemed from other dispensations. There is a difference. Uh, then we spent the last couple of weeks on these four points, purpose of the tribulation, a dispensation of wrath. The rapture, what is it? The purpose of the rapture, and the timing of the rapture. Shane, I've got some uh, feedback up here. Item G was the second coming of Jesus as distinct from the rapture. And we do want to identify the two. And that's what we're going to look at a bit today. And then the millennial kingdom, a literal physical reign of Christ. I'm not sure what I'm going to do next Sunday with the Sunday that, where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. I might just continue the same study, but who knows? It'll be a surprise, so just show up, all right? <laughs> and then the famous and the whatever otherwise I want to share section. And so we'll keep working our way through that. So rapture and second coming distinctives. We know that the rapture takes place after the church age. And this should be very important to our study. There's a lot of reasons for this. We've already addressed the fact that the rapture of the church removes the church from the wrath of God. And the tribulation period is indeed a dispensation of wrath. But God has not appointed us to wrath, but he has appointed us unto salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ. So a couple of 
per- verses in the Bible that I think get confusing for people are my focus today. A simple study on a couple of things. First is our text. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. I'll talk more about that in the days to come. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Now the fact that Paul calls this a mystery tells us that it was hidden in the Old Testament but now revealed in the New. And we should keep that in mind when we're talking about the rapture in distinction from the second coming. Then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, harpazo, which is where we get the word rapturo, which is Latin, the translation from the Greek in the Latin Bible, which we've picked up as the nomenclature for the catching up or the taking away of the bride of Christ prior to the tribulation. So then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. And if God has not appointed us to wrath, we should be comforted. And he took the wrath of God in our place for our sin. There's no reason at all for the believer to be here on the earth during the outpouring of the wrath of God. Remember Revelation chapter six, every man, woman, and child cries out, hide us from the wrath of God and from the lamb. We will not ever cry out, hide me from the wrath of our savior. We are the ones that have been protected from wrath because Jesus took the wrath of God in our place for our sin. Amen? Amen. Okay, so couple of things to observe here. Number one, the rapture, Jesus comes for his bride, the living and the dead in Christ. So we who are alive and remain shall not precede those that have already gone on ahead. So there will be a physical resurrection in Christ because of his physical resurrection. And we will be taken by Jesus to meet the Lord in the air. He comes for his bride. The rapture, Uh, The translated saints go to heaven. This is what Jesus was referring to when he said, in my father's house are many mansions. I'm going away. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. Item three, the rapture is imminent. It could happen at any moment and has no prerequisite signs. Whereas the second coming does. There's many things that have to happen before the second coming. Item four, at the rapture, evil is unleashed or yeah, unleashed by the removal of the restrainer. So when the one who is restraining is removed, all hell breaks loose on this earth. And it is ridiculous to think that we're going to be here during that time, especially since God is using us by the power of the Holy Spirit to be salt and light. Number five, the rapture is a blessing for the believer. It is the blessed hope. So we're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Number six, the rapture is not directly stated in the Old Testament. And so again, this is a mystery, not stated in the Old Testament. Number seven, the rapture occurs before the tribulation, which is Daniel's 70th week that we discussed last week. The heptads, the groups of sevens, and all that relates to the prophecy concerning the discipline that God has intended for Israel to bring them to their knees. Item number eight, at the rapture, we meet the Lord in the air. Item number nine, at the rapture, only his own see him. And finally, number 10, the tribulation begins a seven-year 
peace treaty. And so these are the things that we know about the rapture. And they're to be contrasted with those things that relate to the second coming. So the second coming will take place after the seven-year tribulation. This is when the Lord returns to the earth. Remember, we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air at the rapture, but we will return with the Lord when he returns with his garments stained with blood, first in Edom and then to the Mount of Olives. And this is going to follow the tribulation period, and that will be the entryway into the millennial kingdom. And so there we will have the marriage supper of the Lamb. There we will be reigning with Christ for the literal thousand years. So here's a couple of second coming passages. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Remember at the second coming or at the rapture of the church, only the elect see him. But in this case, every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so Amen. The tribes here relate to Israel because the revelation of who Jesus is takes place after the tribulation. Refer to Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14. And they will mourn because they recognize Jesus as their Messiah. And they realize that they are the ones who crucified the Lord of glory. Secondly, we can see in Revelation chapter 19. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords. So when he comes at the second coming, he comes in war, he comes in judgment, and he's going to come to rescue Israel from annihilation. By that time, two thirds of Israel will be killed off, but they will never cease to be a nation before the Lord from this time forth. Consider the date and know that Israel will never be wiped out again. And when things continue to increase and then during the tribulation period, when all hell is breaking loose on the earth and the nations of the earth gather against Israel, the Lord is going to personally come back with the armies in heaven, clothed in white, to rescue Israel and establish his earthly kingdom, a kingdom that he promised Israel. This is why we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It is still in the future. It is a promise to Israel. And the church will be raptured before the wrath of God is poured out during the tribulation. And we will return with the Lord at the time of the second coming, where we will enjoy the literal thousand year millennial kingdom. So a couple of observations again. Number one, at the second coming, Jesus returns with his bride. Remember at the rapture, we meet the Lord in the air. He comes for his bride, but in this case, he comes with his bride. Number two, the second coming, no one is translated to heaven. The resurrection that takes place there allows people to dwell on the earth. Even the immortals will be dwelling on the earth with the Lord as he reigns for the thousand years. Item three, the second coming follows predictive signs, including the tribulation. So there's no sign that needs to happen before the rapture. It it can happen at any moment. It's imminent. But there are many things that have to take place before the second coming of Jesus Christ occurs. And so that includes the seven-year tribulation. Item number four. Just after the second coming, Satan is bound for a thousand years and evil is restrained. But remember, when he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, that takes place at the time of the rapture. So evil is unleashed. But in this case, evil is restrained. There's a distinction between the rapture and the second coming. 
Number five, the second coming is blessing for the nation and remnant of Israel. Jesus, the hope of Israel. The expression, the hope of Israel is found in the Old Testament, not his name, Jesus, in this case. Now, in in the processes of time, now we know who the Messiah is. And he will be known to them, uh, all of Israel. And so the second coming is a blessing for the nation and remnant of Israel, rescuing them from all the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan that has been poured out to try indeed to annihilate and wipe out from the face of the earth, the nation and people of Israel. Number six, the second coming is specifically predicted in the Old Testament. Many passages in the Old Testament talk about the second coming, the coming of the Lord, the establishing of his kingdom, Israel being the head of the nations, the prosperity of Israel. Uh, But the rapture, of course, is not mentioned in the Old Testament. It's a mystery that we focus on in our text. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. A mystery is something that was hidden in the Old Testament and is revealed in the New We should understand that. Item seven, the second coming concludes the tribulation. At the rapture, the Antichrist will come onto the scene following our disappearance and sign up seven-year peace treaty with Israel. Uh, After the seven years, then we have the second coming. Number eight, the second coming, Jesus returns to the earth. Number nine, at the second coming, every eye shall see him. Remember, only the elect see him, the church, the bride, see him at the time of the rapture. But at the second coming, every eye shall see him. And again, refer to Revelation and Zechariah 12 uh, and 13. And finally, number 10, at the second coming, the battle of Armageddon occurs. Revelation 19 and Ezekiel 38 and 39. I realize that there are many people that place the Ezekiel Gog Magog invasion at a different point in history. I don't. I believe that the Gog Magog invasion will culminate with the Battle of Armageddon. And so you will note the parallel passages. If you read Ezekiel 39 and you read Revelation 19, they're almost exactly the same. Uh, The languages are the same. The nations that surround Israel uh, are going to want to stomp her out. And the Lord is going to come and rescue Israel at that time. And so a lot to be said about that. Then you have the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom is a literal thousand years when Jesus will physically reign on the earth and we will be here with him, reigning with him. We have been taken to the father's house for the wedding. We will return after the seven years for the wedding feast. And we will be in immortal bodies reigning with Christ during the literal physical future thousand years. Not to be confused with the post-millennial ideas or the amillennial ideas, we are premillennialists, And we take the scriptures literally in this context. So a couple of passages here to look at. Daniel chapter 12, verses one through three read, and at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, this is also known as Jacob's trouble, the seven-year tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Now, right here is where people get fouled up. They forget that Daniel is written to the Jews. It was written during the old covenant. It was written at the end of the 70 year exile in Babylon and it predicts their future. And so as you start working your way through Daniel 9 and in particular Daniel 11, you begin to realize the predictive nature of this passage as it relates to Israel. It does not relate to the church. Now at that time, the, uh, the many shall be delivered out of the dust. So those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That is the physical resurrection of the body of the Old Testament saints. Now this will also take place at the time of the second coming, not at the time of the rapture. 
And so people read this and they go, see, it has to be post-trib because this is where the saints get resurrected. No, you're failing in the hermeneutic if you don't recognize the distinction between the rapture of the bride of Christ before the wrath of God is poured out and the rapture, if you will, or resurrection, physical resurrection of the Old Testament saints and will point out the tribulation saints at the time of the second coming so that they too can reign with Christ during the thousand year reign. They will be the friends of the bridegroom. I'll come back to that. Revelation chapter 20, verse four, and I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God and who had not worshiped the beast or his image. So they are here during the tribulation. And when the Antichrist comes to power and he causes all men to take the mark and 666 is the number of a man and you know all of this. And so these people that refused to take the mark, they became believers during the tribulation. Many of them were murdered, killed, prosecuted, persecuted, uh, punished uh, until death and they will be raised up at the time of the second coming. Not to be confused with those that will be raised up at the end of the church age, the bride at the rapture. There's a distinction. And when you read these passages, if you don't keep them squared away in your mind, naturally you become confused. You have to understand context. You have to understand the dispensation. Who is Daniel writing to? He's writing to the Jews. And he's talking about a future tribulation and those that are killed during that very tribulation. Well, they will live and they will reign with Christ for a thousand years. And if the plain sense makes the most sense, seek no other sense. So how long are they going to reign? A thousand years. It's kind of a no brainer if you're reading your Bible. So during the millennium at the second coming, the Old Testament and tribulation saints are resurrected. These are the friends and guests at the wedding. Now, admittedly, I have a bunch of slides I didn't get to in the first service, as if. And so, I don't know, maybe next Sunday I'm just going to do continue this study. Maybe I won't even spend as much time, uh, but without uh, neglect of the focus of Resurrection Sunday, which is also a feast of first fruits. We'll be talking about feast of first fruits, which has to do with the resurrection of Jesus. And there's so much to talk about in relationship to this. So maybe it'll be uh, for your listening pleasure <laughs> next Sunday. But the Old Testament saints now Look, I'm not just referring to the old covenant dispensation and the saints from the, the old covenant, which would be from Abraham to John the Baptist. I'm talking about all the Old Testament as we understand it, the saints. So we're, we're dealing with people all the way back to Adam and Eve, and they will be resurrected at the second coming, not to be confused with the rapture, as well as we just read, the tribulation saints that would not receive the mark of the beast, they became believers in Jesus and they were killed during the tribulation. They will be raised up so that they can reign with Christ during the literal, physical, future thousand years. Amen? All right, number two. After the second coming, the sheep and goat judgment occurs. And by the way, if the rapture happened at the end of the tribulation, at the t if the, in other words, if the second coming is the rapture and we're taken to heaven, there would be no one here to judge at the sheep and goat judgment. There would only be goats. There'd be no sheep. And so you have to put your mind on as we work our way through these passages. So the sheep and goat judgment happens after the tribulation period. And the judgment is related to how the nations handled Israel. Now we support Israel today, but during the tribulation period, there will be people who will come to faith in the Lord and they will recognize the truth of scripture and God's covenant with Israel. And they will begin to support Israel. And those are the nations that will be the honored nations that will have opportunity to serve the Lord during the millennial kingdom. 
there will be nations that will be punished. At the front end, Egypt is named in particular. For 40 years, Egypt is going to suffer greatly. And then they will be restored. There will then be another time in which Egypt will be punished because they don't come to keep the Feast of Tabernacles during the Millennial Kingdom. And the Lord says he will send famine upon them. And so the nations will be judged at the sheep and goat judgment. This is not a judgment for you. In fact, let me quote again. And learn this, get it in your head. There is no future condemnatory judgment for the believer. If you have come to Christ, you've been to the cross. He took your punishment for your sins on the cross. There is never going to be a day that he will remember your sins anymore. And why do we know that? Because he said, your sins and lawless deeds, I will remember no more. And if he's going to remember them again in the future, then he lied. And if he lied, you're all going to hell because God can't save you because he is a liar, but he is not a liar. And there is no future condemnatory judgment for the believer. <laughs> Finally, number three, after the second coming, the millennial reign begins. And so the tribulation will begin after the rapture, but after the second coming, the millennial reign will begin when he establishes his people, Israel, in their land, gives them the whole land, and they inherit all the land that God had promised to them. So here's some observations in closing today. Number one, the tribulation refers to Israel and unbelieving Gentiles, not the church. Remember that. Number two, the Old Testament passage related to the tribulation, uh, no Old Testament passage, sorry, no Old Testament passage related to the tribulation mentions the church. In fact, Revelation chapter two and three is the church age. Then you have after these things, Revelation chapter four. He, John is told, come up here and I will show you things that will take place after these things. What things? The church age. You need to, uh, after the church age is over, then the tribulation begins. And there's no Old Testament passage related to the tribulation uh, and that mentions the church. Number three, no New Testament passage pictures the church on earth during the tribulation. Go challenge yourself. Study Revelation chapter 4 through 19 and see if you can find the church. Not there. Item four, the church is not appointed to wrath. We are promised salvation from the wrath to come. Number five, if the church suffers the wrath of God, the completed work of Christ was and is insufficient. This is the big deal for me. This is why I told you that the timing of the rapture is more about soteriology than it is about eschatology. It's more about the finished work of Christ for the believer than it is about the timeline that people want to argue about. If you're here suffering the wrath of God and the tribulation is the dispensation of wrath where God pours out his wrath on all the inhabitants of the whole earth, then Jesus didn't complete the work. But he did pay it all and all to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain and he has washed it white as snow. Never to be remembered again. Number six, it is characteristic of God to deliver believers before divine wrath and judgment. Think about Enoch. Think about Noah. I mean, we go through the processes of looking at patterns in the Bible. How about Lot? Lot was taken out of Sodom before God poured out his wrath on Sodom, which was just a micro examination, if you will, or a micro example of the fiery wrath that is yet to come during the tribulation period. God will remove the righteous out before he pours out his wrath. Number seven, the rapture of the church is not the focus of the passages dealing with the second coming. We have to be able to discern the difference and much of that has to do with context. Number eight, a consistent hermeneutic demands a distinction between saints, church, and saints based upon dispensation and context. You know this as saints, saints, and saints. Because there are Old Testament saints, there's the church age saint, and then there's the tribulation saints. And we have to keep those in perspective as we're reading our Bibles. Number nine, all Old Testament passages addressing the time of Jacob's trouble identify the godly remnant as saints, not 
the church. And so the church is distinguished from all other saints, from other dispensations, and we've already covered that in the last couple of weeks. Number 10, a consistent hermeneutic demands a distinction between tribulation and the great tribulation. This is a problem for people. They say, you, you pre-tribbers, you just want to escape the problems in the world. Think about the rest of the church around the world. Are they escaping the problems? Hey, it's starting to heat up around here. Uh, if you have not remembered the words of Jesus, let me cite for you. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So there's trouble in the world today. So we're not just looking to escape trouble. We are looking to escape the wrath of God that is poured out during the tribulation period. Make it that clear. And so I wanted to uh, go further. I got a couple more points and then I'm going to wrap this up and maybe we'll pick it up next week about the bride and about the resurrection of the bride and about the feast, the wedding feast that's going to take place. But before we do, a couple... Uh, further slides here. Number 11, scripture is to be understood using a literal interpretation method unless identifiably typological or allegorical. This is true of both New Testament and Old Testament passages dealing with the tribulation. And so if the plain sense makes the most sense, right? You guys know the rule. And number 12, since the first 69 weeks of Daniel were literally fulfilled, the final 70th week will have a literal fulfillment as well. And let me just comment on this again. We talked about it last week. I'm going to mention it again. We are today celebrating Palm Sunday. And it was exactly 483 years to the day when the commission to go back and rebuild the city and the walls of Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile. In the, you can read about this in your Bible. Uh, and you should. Nehemiah chapter 2. Read it. <coughs> my apologies. <coughs> That's what happens when I'm hurrying. And uh, the commission to go forth is identified for us in Daniel chapter 9. And it was exactly specified that there would be 483 years from the commission to go back and rebuild the city and its walls until the Messiah comes. And it was exactly 483 years from that commission to the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Nisan 10, to be observed for four days, to be sacrificed for us, the Passover Lamb of God, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world on Nisan 14, only to be raised from the dead three days later on the Feast of First fruits and to be waved out before the Lord in resurrection power. Now, you don't even have to come next week. <laughs> Finally, all 70 weeks of Daniel are in reference to Israel, her relationship to God, her rebellious acts of disobedience, her engagement with Gentile powers and a rejection of Jesus as Messiah. And so there is no reference to the church being involved at all in the 70 weeks of Daniel. They are the literal 70 times seven punishment laid out against Israel because of their continuation in rebellion, even after 70 years in Babylon. And so we're looking forward to the blessed hope. We're not looking for the Antichrist to arise. We're not looking for the peace treaty between the nations and to protect Israel during an early season of the tribulation when the Gog and Magog sees them dwelling in lands of peace without bars and wind, uh, without uh, doors and so that they are at ease. And when they formulate their desire to go down and to take booty from Israel, and indeed the Lord will then rescue Israel at the time of the second coming. And so we are looking for the Lord to catch us away, to take us to heaven, to be with him for seven years where we go to the father's house. And then we will return with him for the wedding feast during the millennial kingdom on the earth in a literal, physical, future, thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. Amen? Amen? Let's stand together as we pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Send us forth today equipped to give an answer to everyone that asks of us for the hope that lies within us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys.
Welcome to Candlelight Christian Fellowship. We are so glad you are here with us today. Join us now as we study the Word of God. Well, good morning, everyone. Would you stand with us as we worship the Lord? Worship the God who was. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory.
peace of God surrounding me. It's casting out all fear. The hand that holds the heavens is the mighty hand that saves. The voice that calms the storm Calling me by name, and I'm singing in the victory, the victory of the cross, and I'm resting in the shadow of your redeeming love, and I'm standing on the promise, the promise of your life, because I am yours forever. Jesus, you are mine. of your grace I'll remember, amen Yes, I'll remember Calvary When you took my place And I'm singing in the victory The victory of the cross And I'm resting in the shadow Of your redeemed
gonna do something a little different. I, I just wanna invite you, we're gonna keep playing and I wanna invite you to pray. Just respond to the Lord as he's speaking to you right now, as you wanna talk to him, give him thanks because there is something to be joyful about, amen? And if you're in a spot where it's really hard, it's really hard to worship him, there's a lot going on, then look forward to what you know is the promise given to you. Thank him for the blood of Jesus, amen.
Father God, that is, that is our prayer, Lord. May our worship be a sweet sound in your ear, Father. Lord, we are here because we love you, because we love the things that you've provided for us, Lord God, only by your saving and redemptive blood shed on the cross for us, Lord God. A church body to be a part of, believers who worship the only one true God, an opportunity to sing our praises, Lord God, to open the word together, to study your inerrant word, Lord God, that you've given to us through the Bible. Father, we thank you, we do, we love you, Lord. We thank you for what you've done through, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We give you all the honor and all the glory forever and ever in Jesus' name. Would you please be seated? Good morning, Candlelight. Uh, welcome to our 1030 service. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. If you are new today, uh, I'd like to give you a special welcome and invite you to, sometime after the service, uh, go out to our information desk, which is out this way, and you can pick up a little welcome packet. Um, and it's got a bunch of information in there so you can learn a little bit more about the church. And there's also a little card in there for you to fill out if you'd like. Uh, you can give that back to us and it just allows us to reach out and to say hi and to personally welcome you to Candlelight. We would love an opportunity to be able to do that. We also have a newcomers class. If you want to come be a part of that, that lets you get to know us a little bit better and meet some of the staff and uh, just go over some of the ministries we do here. Um, after that, we also have a membership class, and so we ask that you would prayerfully consider uh, being a part of that and seeing if membership is something that you want to do. Uh, those classes explain entirely what membership is and, and all of that. Uh, if you're not a member, we still love you, so just want to make sure that's clear. Um, but right now, we're going to go ahead and pray for our three ministries of the week, so let's go before the Lord. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that today we got to wake up and we got to come here and we got to worship you. Lord, and we get to continue to worship you as we read your word, as we sing in songs, as we fellowship with each other. Lord, I pray our hearts would be set on you. Lord, I pray for Pastor Mark at Coeur d'Alene Church of the Nazarene. Lord, bless him today and bless his congregation with his teaching. Use him to teach your word profoundly. Lord, open the ears to what it is you have for him to say, that you would use him powerfully in the ministry, Lord. And we pray for Alan Noggle with Gideon's International. Lord, bless him. Use him in the ministry that he is in as we already know that you have. But continue to bless him. Uh, continue to allow him to work in that ministry. And uh, Lord, we are thankful for him. We are thankful for what he does. Lord, we also pray for Terry, who is a CPA here. We thank you so much for the work that she does and the, uh, the stuff that we don't want to do, Lord, all of the tax things, all of the uh, difficult financial side of things that she handles. We thank you so much for what she does, as well as um, just the heart she has for you, Lord, and the heart she has for studying your word and, and being a part of that. And we thank you that we get to work with her. And in Jesus' name, amen. Um, if you are a child, you may now go to your class. If you are a youth, um, go to the lobby, uh, and Jeff Gambrino will take you to where he teaches you. And if you're an adult, uh, just stand up, say hi to those around you, and we'll have a, a brief moment of fellowship. Amen. Thanks for listening to Candlelight Christian Fellowship's live broadcast. While our church family takes a break to greet each other, we would like to tell you a bit about ourselves. Candlelight Senior Pastor Paul Van Oy desires for all to grow in God's grace through the knowledge of the Lord. Pastor Paul and our pastoral staff are led to speak the truth in love as they teach about life challenges in today's world. The ministry goal is to teach God's word verse by verse and apply scripture in a way that's easy to understand. Candlelight is located in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho on the corner of Highway 95 and Dalton Avenue. We would love to meet you here in person, but realize that may not be possible. If you are unable to attend church at the Candlelight Campus, please continue to listen or watch online and spread the word about Candlelight's ministry. If you have a request, we would love to pray for you. Email us at hope at candlelight.org or call us at 208-772-7755. Thanks again for listening.
We're down to the uh, fourth Sunday of the month when we take a few moments to look at the persecuted church. It's Palm Sunday today, and we have a lot of material to get through, so I thought I'd kick right into it. Uh, Nigeria is always having trouble, and another major event happened over the last couple of weeks. Muslim terrorists killed uh, two Christians and kidnapped hundreds of others in an attack near the city of Kaduna in northern Nigeria. Gunmen abducted dozens of people just days after more than 250 pupils from a school in the very same state had been kidnapped. And this happened uh, almost 10 years. It's been 10 years since Boko Haram uh, kidnapped about 250 schoolgirls back in 2014. That got the attention of the world's media. However, I went in to check this story when I first was alerted to it, and I looked at the BBC website, and they reported the story that had been this kidnappings, but they didn't really identify too clearly who the kidnappers were, but especially the fact that the kidnappers were Muslims and the kidnappees were Christians. Uh, and this is really important because the media described the conflict in Nigeria as being ethnic conflict. It's not. It's a one-way conflict. Muslims are killing Christians. It's a genocidal type of thing. So in all the screaming that we see going on around the world about uh, genocide, especially supposedly in Gaza, uh, in reality it's been ongoing in Nigeria and the world's media just goes, eh, whatever. You know, we've had uh, close to 20 to 30,000 Christians murdered in the last 10 years, 4,000 in the year between 2021 and 2022. So it's important to remember that, especially when they say, for example, uh, talk about the supposed genocide in Gaza, and they give us wildly inflated figures like 30,000 civilians have been killed. They don't identify civilians from combatants. The number is almost statistically impossible, but the media just queue right up and they go for it. Uh, we're doing a series, by the way, here in the church called Stone of Stumbling. It's on the website, and also it's available on Rumble and on YouTube when I don't get thrown in YouTube jail, um, which is really easy to do nowadays. All you have to do is tell the truth, uh, and that'll make sure that you do. Uh, anyway, and we started, we're, I think, in episode three now, we started in the Stone of Stumbling uh, to look at the history of how... Palestine got to where it is today, Palestine and Israel, because so much of what is reported is going uncovered by the world's media. And I've begun listening to the world's Islamic press to see what they're saying about it, and then listening to the Israeli media. Uh, and you realize that the Western version of what's happening, I call it the wokus pocus version, as the Western media are seeing it, uh, is totally detached from reality, including our current administration's plan for a two-state solution. Nobody wants it. The Palestinians don't want it. The Israelis don't want it. Blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on. It's much more complex than they're ever reporting. They see it through this neo-Marxist filter of oppressors and oppressed and colonialists and all the jargon we've heard before. It doesn't match the reality of it. So that's why we started to do this series. And we are going to do something, since Pastor Paul's talking about eschatology, uh, we are going to do something, probably recording it next week, and that will be on Muslim eschatology for the end times and how the competition all revolves around the city of Jerusalem because the Shiites expect the Imam Mahdi, the 12th Imam, to return and to set up his caliphate in Jerusalem from where he will kill all the Jews and get rid of all the Israelis and make war on Western civilization and Christianity. Uh, there are some books that are circulating in the Middle East. So you never hear this on the media, do you? Uh, the books circulating in the Middle East that are novels but having incredible impact on the thinking, even of terrorists. And the best description that I have is it's sort of like Tom Clancy meets Tim LaHaye meets Mohammed, you know. Uh, but they are fulfilling these end times expectations. And Iran has made this impeccably clear that this is what they're involved in. You know, they're paving the way for the return of the 12th Imam. Uh, and Israel is the target, and that's why they're funding all these other groups. So you might be interested in that series. Pakistan is in economic turmoil right now. Uh, this is important from a persecution point of view. The IMF was there, I think it was last week, uh, talking about another loan. This is only going to be a Band-Aid measure to rescue the rupee, which is in trouble. It's not quite in free fall, but it's sinking continuously against the dollar. And they also have had two years trying to form a new government. 
a previous prime minister was jailed. It, it's a lot of chaos. Why is this significant for persecution? And the reason is because when the tensions rise in the country and the economic situation becomes difficult, you know, and over here in the West we sneeze because somebody raises the price of oil. Uh, in Pakistan, they have riots because, and in third world countries because it pushes them below subsistence level, the cost of energy. Uh, and it's only been since last August that Muslim mobs destroyed something like 50 churches, several hundred homes, killed a dozen or so people all based on the allegation that some blasphemy had been committed. And that's why this is really creating a really dangerous situation for Christians over there. Um, I'll come back to Pakistan in a second. In Uganda, a Christian was slain for leading Muslims to faith in Christ. Islamic extremists in eastern Uganda on March 8th killed 45-year-old Kiisa Masolo, he had returned to his home after preaching on the streets of local towns where seven masked men dressed in Islamic attire broke in and took him away. Three of them stayed back and told his mother that Allah was very displeased with her son and they were going to punish him. After about four hours of looking for him, his body was found somewhere in some bushes with a note written in Arabic, which they couldn't read. Which is interesting, by the way, because say, for example, in Pakistanis or people from non-Arabic language Muslim countries recite the Quran, they do it in Arabic and they can't understand what they're saying. They just learn the prayers in, in Arabic, you know. Um, so please pray for, uh, for Pakistan. I'm sorry, for Uganda too. We have a lot of that stuff going on and also in some other countries like Somalia, uh, I think the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and of course Nigeria is a mess right now. Last month I mentioned briefly, I asked you to pray for Myanmar, and I couldn't talk a lot about it because the civil war there is affecting Christian institutions like orphanages. Now let me tell you what was behind all that, I can talk a bit more. There was an orphanage with 18 children and six staff. The war situation had finally become intolerable where they were. There were bombs going off outside the, the uh, compound. There were people being shot in the streets. And so they made an executive decision to make a run for it. They set out at 4 o'clock in the morning in two vans with the whole staff and all the kids. They drove through military-controlled territory in the middle of the night where bridges had been destroyed and they had to go across rivers, etc. cetera. Uh, it was very hazardous, but they finally made it to safety in India, where they are now, and they're trying to reestablish themselves there. So for those of you who prayed, yes, that's one of those, whew, you know, because that's what everybody was praying, is that God would make them invisible as they made this very dangerous uh, journey, and I don't think they were singing Climb Every Mountain when they, when they did it, you know, like in the movie. Um, so I wanted to mention this because a lot of the times what we do here with our Asia missions is not transparent to you. We don't talk about a lot of it. Sometimes we can't for obvious reasons. But we use a lot of the funding to provide food for people who don't have it, buy motorcycles for pastors that desperately need it. You know, you can get a new Harley, <laughs> hold your breath, for about $600, $1,200 U.S., uh, if you buy it in Pakistan, and some pastors just need this to avoid being on public transit so they won't be attacked by Muslim radicals, especially this one pastor we did operating right under the nose of the Taliban in western uh, Pakistan. So the, if you would keep the contributions coming into the Asia missions, because we're doing that type of thing, and it's not always sort of public to hear uh, to everybody else so that you recognize that. But this is what we have going on, rescuing people out of jail when they need it, getting them health uh, supplies when they need it or when they need treatment that they can't afford. And also, just like on uh, Resurrection Sunday, the Candlelight Christian Fellowship there is going to be providing um, food to a couple of hundred people that need it. So, Lord God, please remember those suffering for their faith, and please remember those especially who are least known, but most widely in need of your support. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. <clears throat> My name is John Padula. I am a uh, pastor over at the Altar Church. I'm the outreach pastor. I've been there about 15 years. Uh, I've been pastoring there for 12 years. And, uh, my wife, I met my wife two years after I came to Christ on December 5th of 2008, and we have four beautiful children. But before that, uh, I had never heard the gospel 
I was 30 years old in North Idaho the first time I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, when I heard the gospel, I was prayed over, I received Christ, and he set me free, and he gave me a brand new life. Uh, I couldn't have kids before I was saved, and the Lord totally healed me, uh, not just spiritually, but also physically. Uh, before that, before I heard the gospel, my life was a complete wreck. I was a drug addict for 17 years. I was addicted to methamphetamines. Uh, when I was a kid, I found all of my dad's pornography, and I ended up addicted to pornography for 21 years, and my life was in complete shambles. And uh, yeah, 15 years ago, I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He set me free from all of that. And uh, here, here's my heart and why I want to share that. Thank you. I, I had no idea what the Bible said, not hearing the gospel and not being raised in a Christian home. So I got saved and started reading the word. And I found in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I had no clue. So as I'm reading the scripture, I'm starting to realize, man, everything that God said in his word happened in my life. And uh, I'm just super excited to be here today. God has put it on my heart to run for Kootenai County Commissioner. So that is my current journey, and I would covet your prayers. Uh, I know I have a past and a background, but I'm going to hold you all accountable right now. Are there any people in here who were sinners or not sinners before they were saved? Anybody? Anybody? Not one? Anybody been a Christian their whole life, born just right into Christ? Amen. So we're all on an equal playing field, right? I was a sinner before I got saved. When it, Jesus saved me, he radically changed my life, and nothing has been the same ever since. So I would covet your prayers. My desire as county commissioner is to get back to a place where we are public servants, not politicians. Uh, at the altar, we let a lot of people who are running for office come and speak to our congregation. And what they do is they get up, and they give their political spiel, and then they leave, and then they get into office, and they just operate as a politician. Listen, I will vote for character over education. I will vote for character over experience any day of the week. And we need to put men and women who are filled with the Holy Ghost into these offices to serve our community and stop failing the people. So I would covet your prayers, and God bless you guys. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You guys, uh, I could not help but stand with Johnny. He asked me if he could come and talk to you guys, and I just said, absolutely, I want to. Especially because right now, we have people in our community that think that because Johnny was a felon, that he should not serve us in a public and official manner. But you can still be a pastor and be a felon, right? That's right. That's why you and I are pastors together, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just am stunned to think that anyone in our community is so immature as to not recognize that God is able to change people's lives. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You have my endorsement, my friend. Amen. I love you, Johnny. I love you too. Thank you very Lord, much. Lord, thank you so much for this man. Lead and guide him and direct him, his beautiful wife, Amanda, and their kids. Let Johnny be right where you want him. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thanks, buddy. Love you. Well, we are in our 12th lesson in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the fourth part of a series on the rapture of the church, the pre-tribulation rapture. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll continue our way through. If you're visiting with us, you can go back and look at these in the archives, and we'll keep building on these over the next weeks. So, Lord, thank you for this time. And, Lord, nourish us, we pray, by your word, by the truth. Allow us to be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks of us for the hope that lies within us with meekness and godly fear. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been working through an outline. We first talked about dispensational theology and why it's important to biblical understanding. Then we looked at the church as distinct from Israel and the redeemed from other dispensations. Very important study. The church is not Israel and Israel is not the church. 
Then the last couple of weeks we spent on these four points, the purpose of the tribulation, the rapture, what is it? The purpose of the rapture and the timing of the rapture. And then today I want to spend just a few minutes with you on the second coming of Jesus as distinct from the rapture. This is where we get in trouble. A lot of people read passages that relate to the second coming and they read them as though they are referring to the rapture. We need to rightly divide the word of truth. And then we will be looking at the millennial kingdom, a literal physical reign of Christ and the infamous, now infamous and the whatever otherwise I want to share section. And that's just keeping things in my back pocket, right? So the rapture, the rapture takes place at the end of the church age. The bookmarks are the day of Pentecost and then the rapture of the church, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the removal of the Holy Spirit. These are the bookmarks. The tribulation follows the rapture of the church and the tribulation is a dispensation of wrath. We covered this last week. And so a couple of verses that I want to highlight for you, you know this one, we've been working our way through it in our study in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery in the New Testament is something that was hidden in the Old Testament. It's still present. It's still a, 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 it's something that God wants us to understand, but it's not fully revealed. In the New Testament, it is revealed. And now we understand things that we didn't understand before. And so Paul, the apostle, tells the church in Corinth, this is a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet... For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And then we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again... Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will be raised first. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. This word is harpazo in Greek. It is translated into the Latin Bible rapturo, which is where we get the word rapture. And so we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so as believers looking forward to the rapture, we are to be comforted. If we are to be here during the tribulation, the wrath of God that is poured out on every inhabitant of the earth, there is no comfort in that. If we think that we're supposed to be looking for the rise of the Antichrist and all the problems that are facing Israel in its near future, even the things that Israel is enduring today, there's no comfort in that. We are to be looking for the coming of the Lord for his bride, the blessed hope. And so a couple of things I want to point out to you in items for your consideration today. Number one, at the rapture, Jesus comes for his bride, the living and the dead in Christ. The dead in Christ shall rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Secondly, at the rapture, the translated saints go to heaven which Jesus referred to as his father's house. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And the place that he's going is heaven. And he's taking us to heaven. At the second coming, people come back to the earth. We will be coming back with him. But at the rapture, we go to heaven. Thirdly, the rapture is imminent. It could occur at any moment and has no prerequisite signs. And so when we are looking for the next thing on the prophetic 
timetable, we know that the very next major prophetic act will be the rapture of the church. If we were post-tribbers or if we believe that the second coming is the rapture, then we would be looking for the Antichrist to rise to power. We would be looking for the wrath of God to be poured out on the inhabitants of the whole earth. And again, there would be no comfort in that. We are looking for the Lord. It could happen at any moment. There are no signs that need to take place before the rapture can take place even today. Amen. Number four, at the rapture, evil is unleashed by the removal of the restrainer. He who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. This is Second Thessalonians chapter 2. So evil is unleashed by the removal of the restrainer, the person of the Holy Spirit who is active in the church today. You and I are salt and light. He is working through us today. Number five, the rapture is a blessing for the believer. It is the blessed hope. Uh, Wrath to come is not a blessing. Uh, It is God's holy anger poured out upon the inhabitants of the world, Jew and Gentile, who have rejected the gospel in the church age. And the gospel, as you know, has been preached to Jew and Gentile for the last 2,000 years, which is also why we refer to this dispensation as the dispensation of grace or the church age. Number six, the rapture is not directly stated in the Old Testament. Uh, We'll talk about that when we look at the items related to the second coming. Item number seven, the rapture occurs before the tribulation, Daniel's 70th week. Remember, all 490 years that were prophesied to Daniel relate to Israel, not to the church. Number eight, the rapture. At the, at the rapture, we meet the Lord in the air. And when the Lord comes back, we are going to come back with him to the earth. And so these distinctions need to be kept in mind. Number nine, at the rapture, only his own see him. At the second coming, every eye will see him. And then number 10, the tribulation begins with a seven-year peace treaty. And so these things are correspondingly opposite of those things that happened during the time of the second coming of Christ. And so here's a couple of things that we should look at related to the second coming. It is after the tribulation. So the the rapture takes place, then the seven-year tribulation, and then the second coming. Here's a couple of verses about the second coming. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Remember, we just learned that only his own will see him at the time of the rapture. We meet the Lord in the air. In this case, he comes back to the earth. His feet will land at the Mount of Olives, and everyone will see him probably on CNN. (laughs) It will probably still be here. The way it's going, so will Fox News, I'm sorry to say. Second coming. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So at the rapture, the blessed hope of the believer, we go to meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming, we return as armies with the Lord, clothed in white, when he comes to take vengeance on his enemies, those that did not stand for and with Israel. And those that have now at that time surrounded Israel and are threatening to wipe her out completely. The Lord is going to rescue Israel from annihilation at the time of the second coming and then following will be the millennial kingdom when he establishes Israel, all of her boundaries and its place as head of all the nation. And so there's a distinction between the rapture of the church 
and the second coming of the church. And a forensic look at the Bible will help us with this. So a couple of things to consider. Number one, at the second coming, Jesus returns with his bride. Remember at the rapture, he comes for his bride. This time he comes with his bride. At the second coming, no one is translated to heaven. The dead in Christ have been brought up to meet the Lord in the air. We will be with the Lord for the wedding. We will be returning seven years later for the wedding feast during the millennial kingdom. We come with him, but no one is translated to heaven. There will be a resurrection and we're going to talk about that, but it is not for the church age saints. Number three, the second coming follows predictive signs. I mentioned that the rapture is imminent. There's no signs that need to be fulfilled before the rapture. But there are many things that need to be um, accomplished or things that must come to pass before the second coming of Jesus. Number four, just after the second coming, Satan is bound for a thousand years and evil is restrained. But after the rapture, the restrainer is removed. Evil is unleashed. So there's a distinction. So the restrainer is removed at the rapture and evil is restrained at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Number five, the second coming is blessing for the nation and remnant of Israel. Jesus, the hope of Israel. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus is their hope. And indeed, when he comes for them to rescue them, he will indeed be their hope because they will be rescued from the annihilation planned by Satan that's been going on since the very beginning of time in and with Israel. And God's covenant with Israel is sure. He will fulfill all of his promises to Israel. Number six, the second coming is specifically predicted in the Old Testament. I mentioned that the rapture is a mystery hidden in the Old Testament. And now we do know that there are many scriptures that talk about the coming of the Lord to establish his earthly kingdom, to reign for a thousand years all over the Old Testament. In particular, you can look at Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48 and learn much about the millennial kingdom, along with the, in, nearly the entirety of the book of Isaiah. So continuing, the second coming concludes the tribulation, whereas the rapture precedes the tribulation. At the second coming, Jesus returns to the earth rather than we going to heaven. And at the second coming, every eye will see him. Only his own see him at the rapture, but in this case, every eye will see him. And the nations of the earth will mourn because of him. At the second coming, the battle of Armageddon will occur. This is found in Revelation 19 and Ezekiel 38 and 39. This is something that you should pay very careful attention to. The Ezekiel Gog Magog invasion is often thought to be something that will happen before the rapture. That is untrue. First and foremost, I will tell you the doctrine of imminency would be defeated because you would have to have some sign that would take place before the rapture. The Ezekiel invasion, the Gog Magog invasion will happen in the midway point of the tribulation period and beyond. And so they will be planning their attack in the first half when the Antichrist has signed a peace treaty with the nation around Israel, giving them a pseudo peace for a short period of time. And then he will break that peace treaty midway through. And the, the nations that are joined together with Gog, Magog, will come together against Israel to wipe her out. And the Lord is going to put an end to that and rescue Israel. We see this in parallel passages in Ezekiel 39 and also Revelation chapter 19. And so the millennium follows the tribulation and the second coming. So the preparatory verses that need to be examined in this case. Concerning the millennium, we, le we learn this. At that time, at that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble. This is the tribulation, Jacob's trouble, such as never it was since there was a nation. Remember, we talked about the fact that Jeremiah, Daniel, and Jesus all identified the tribulation as a unique period of time and a unique event, unlike anything else. So there, this will be a time of trouble such as never once since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. 
the deliverance will take place at the time of the second coming and everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is why many people read this as a rapture passage because they see a resurrection here. But this should not be confused with the rapture passages because the rapture takes place before the tribulation and before the necessity of a intervention to rescue Israel. And so we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the dead in Christ will meet the Lord in the air. Seven year tribulation takes place. Then the Gog Magog invasion takes its effect. Then the Lord comes back at the time of the second coming in wrath to rescue Israel from the surrounding nations. At that time, Old Testament saints and tribulation saints will be raised up. They will not be going to heaven. They will just be raised up to life to reign with Christ during the thousand year period of time. After the thousand year millennial reign, there will be a resurrection of the unsaved for judgment. They will stand at the great white throne judgment. You will not stand in judgment at the great white throne judgment. And we know that we're not going to be here during the tribulation. And why do we know that we will not be here during the tribulation? And why do we know that we will not stand at the great white throne judgment? Because the Lord has promised that we have passed from death into life. We shall not come unto judgment. He has forgiven our sins. Our sins and our lawless deeds will be remembered no more. Now, if the Lord remembers your sins in the future, he lied. If you have gone before the Lord and your sins have been forgiven, you are a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. You're no longer a felon in Christ. You're just new in Christ. Amen. And so we are those people that will never learn this again. We will never experience a future condemnatory judgment. There is no future condemnatory judgment for the believer. You are in Christ Jesus. You've been made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. All right. Revelation chapter 20, verse four. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshiped the beast or his image. So if they were here during the tribulation and not worshiped the beast or his image and they were killed, they're going to be resurrected after the tribulation, not to be confused with the rapture. And so they will be raised up to live with Christ for a thousand years. And by the way, it is a literal thousand years. If the Bible says that Christ is going to rule for a thousand years, and if we're going to be raised up to live with him on this earth, and we're going to reign with him for a thousand years, and the tribulation saints are going to reign with him for a thousand years, and the Bible says it's going to be a thousand years, I'm going to ask you a question. How many years is it going to be? A thousand. And it's the same thing as the literal six-day creation. If God created man in six days, he created man in six days, right? This whole creation in six days. And so God says what he means and he means what he says. And if the plain sense makes the most sense, you guys are okay. I'm all right with you. (laughs) Some observations here. Just a couple more things today. At the second coming, the Old Testament and tribulation saints are resurrected. The church has already been resurrected at the rapture, but the Old Testament saints, that's from Adam all the way to John the Baptist, they, those that have died, will be raised up at the second coming, not to be confused with the rapture. The tribulation saints we just read about will be raised up at the time of the second coming, and they are raised up so that they can inherit the kingdom that's been promised to them. Remember, the father has promised the kingdom to Israel. And this was what Jesus intended them to understand when he taught the disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. It's not just about you going to heaven. It's about the Lord fulfilling his promises to Israel and he will reign on the earth and they will be the head of the nations. And thus we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And it's quite literal. Let's take the word of God seriously. Amen. Amen. Number two, I only have like 17 points. It's fine. (laughs) After the second coming, the sheep and goat judgment occurs. If the rapture happened at the end of the tribulation, there would be no goats to judge or no sheep to judge. 
See, you got to think this through. If there's a sheep and goat judgment after the tribulation and the rapture happens at the time of the second coming, all of the saints would go to heaven. There's no need for a judgment. It would just be a judgment upon the earth. But there is a sheep and goat judgment, the judgment of the nations, because the church has already been raptured. Then there's seven years and do people do get saved during the tribulation period. Now, millions, billions of people will die during the tribulation, but there will be people saved. And when they get saved, they're going to read their Bible. And when they read their Bible, they're going to realize God has a covenant with Israel. And they're going to be able to know that the Lord is coming back to rescue Israel. And they're going to take a stand for Israel. And those are the nations that will be the sheep nations. The question is, what did you do with my brethren? Remember, uh, enter into my kingdom, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And they will ask her why. They will say why. It is because what you did and did not do for the least of these, my brethren, which is Israel. He is telling them he's going to judge the nations based on the treatment of Israel. I think we should stand with Israel. How about you? Number three, after the second coming, the millennial reign begins. The thousand year reign. What happened? Oops is right. Oh, never mind. There was only three points. I, have, I had two groups of 10 and then the three and I'm rushing. I, the clock is bugging me again. And so now I've got like 13 points and we're done. Is that okay? So this is hermeneutical principles. You just arguments you want to think about. The tribulation relates to Israel and unbelieving Gentiles, not the church. The church is not even mentioned in relationship to the tribulation. The Old Testament passages related to the tribulation does not mention the church. There is no Old Testament passage related to the tribulation that mentions the church. Number three, no New Testament passage pictures the church on earth during the tribulation. Look, if you could read the whole, pa- the whole thing in Revelation about the tribulation, which is chapter 4 through 19, there's no mention of the church at all. The church is from chapter two and three. It's the church age. And then after these things, the Lord says, I will show you things that are yet to come. And so the tribulation does not have the church pictured in any form on the earth at that time. Uh, The church is not appointed to wrath. We are promised salvation from the wrath to come. I'm glad because Jesus took the wrath of God for us in our place and we get to go to heaven and we will never suffer the wrath of God again. Uh, Now, if the church suffers the wrath of God, the complete work of Christ was and is insufficient. I just have to remind you from two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, that I told you that our eschatology and the timeline related to our eschatology and the timeline that where, where we place the rapture should be more related to soteriology than eschatology and the timeline. So in other words, if Jesus actually paid it all, then the wrath of God will never be poured out on us. And if the tribulation is the wrath of God, we can't be here. Otherwise, it symbolizes the fact that Jesus did not indeed pay it all that we have to suffer for our sins in the future to get cleaned up. Uh, No, no, no. Number six, it is characteristic of God to deliver believers before divine wrath and judgment. And so think about Enoch, think about Noah, think about Lot, all these types. Uh, Even Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fiery furnace, but where's Daniel? He's not pictured in there. There's typology all over the Bible that shows that God is rescuing his people from divine judgment and then even protecting his own in judgment. It's incredible what God is doing with Israel and with the church. The distinctions are there. uh, Number seven, the rapture of the church is not the focus of the passages dealing with the second coming. We have some understanding of that already in this briefing today. Number eight, a consistent hermeneutic demands a distinction between saints, church, and saints based on dispensation and context. 
In the book of Daniel, when we're talking about saints, he's talking about the Jews. In the church age, and he talks about us being saints, we're talking about the church. During the tribulation, when there are tribulation saints, he's talking about those that are alive during the tribulation, many of whom suffer death during the tribulation. So we have to be able to distinguish between saints, saints, and saints. And if you don't rightly divide the word of truth and understand the dispensations and understand the context of these passages, you're going to be confused. And it's understandable that many people get confused about these things. Number nine, all Old Testament passages addressing the time of Jacob's trouble, which is the 70th week of Daniel, which is the tribulation, identify the godly remnant as saints, not the church. Number 10, a consistent hermeneutic demands a distinction between tribulation and the great tribulation. And this has always been a, a challenge because people accuse pre-tribbers, that's you, that's me, pre-tribulational individuals as being those that are just looking for an easy way out. But that's never been the biblical model. Look at the persecuted church we just identified a minute ago. There's people that are suffering greatly today. People in America are suffering greatly today. And things are not going to get better. Things are going to get worse. And so in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, Jesus said. I have overcome the world. In him, we overcome. But that doesn't remove us from the possibility of tribulation. But the great tribulation is the outpouring of the wrath of God on the inhabitants of the earth. And as mentioned, he will never pour out his wrath on you, for he poured out his wrath on Jesus. Amen. Number 11, scripture is to be understood stood using a literal interpretation method unless identifiably typological and allegorical. This is true of both New Testament and Old Testament passages dealing with the tribulation. And so if there's typology, it's easy to understand. I will, like I, Jesus said, I wanted to gather you together like a hen does her chicks and you would not. He's not referring to himself as a hen or you as chicks. Uh, you know, you're, you are uh, the, the sheep, you know, there's allegory in this. But when the Bible is speaking literally like a thousand years, then we should take literally a thousand years. When the plain sense makes the most sense, Seek no other sense. There's two people that know it. Oh, Mateo. Good job, Mateo. Number, I should have known it was Mateo, huh? Number 12, since the first 69 weeks of Daniel were literally fulfilled, the final 70th week will have a literal fulfillment as well. And we know that they were literally fulfilled. It was exactly 483 years from the command to rebuild the city and its walls until Jesus came into Jerusalem to be crucified on Palm Sunday, which we celebrate even today. And so 483 literal years. We know then that the seven-year tribulation will be seven literal years. When the plain sense makes the most sense, seek no other sense. All 70 weeks of Daniel are in reference to Israel, her relationship to God, her rebellious acts of disobedience, her engagement with Gentile powers, and a rejection of Jesus as Messiah. You have not rejected Jesus, and you're not in a relationship with Gentile powers. We are the bride of Christ. We are the individuals that God has redeemed unto himself that will be taken out in a pre-tribulation rapture, which is the blessed hope of every believer. We are looking for and hastening the coming of the Lord because we anticipate that blessed hope, a time of rejoicing. Every one of us will indeed enjoy in him and in him alone. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together as we pray. Father, thank you for this time and thank you for your word. Allow us to process much today, thinking through all these things. We ask that you would use this information as we are equipped to be able to take these things and give hope to others. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.